evening. I do have a special prayer that uh, I didn't mention from up in the booth. If y'all just pray for Trey um, and my alarm that was set to be on mute. All right, sorry about the distraction. But if y'all pray for Trey, he, he's distracted. And um, I know they all go through it. He's 14 years old and all that. But, uh, you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't come to church tonight. And, you know, I hate to admit that. You know, he was, he was in this church, golly, from birth, you know. And, and uh, now that he, I don't want to say he has a choice, but at a certain point you just have to leave the house and you can't argue anymore. And, uh, and uh, yeah, just, just pray for Trey. Lift him up and... Uh, and as the Lord just touches him and, and, and lets him remind him that some of the miracles he's done in his life with the healing of the ears and the, and the direction that he's given him and the, and the falls and spills that have turned out that there's nothing wrong with him. So anyway, y'all lift that up. I'd appreciate that. Uh, if you all want to uh, fumble over to Judges, Judges uh, 11 and 12, we're going to hop around in there in a little bit up and down. And... Uh, you know, I noticed that some, most of these sermons, at least on my heart, I've, I've kind of felt that they've uh, been on uh, being more than we are now in Christ. And uh, I know it just, maybe that's just what's been quickened in my heart about it. Even Ryan, the way he was talking about uh, in his sermon and what Pastor and Tony and stuff like that, it, it's really been challenging me. And, and I felt like I, ch you know, I had a word for you on, uh, in January where I was challenging you guys to plant that seed of faith, right? Uh, to, to make a, uh, a possibility into a probability. And uh, so, you know, I really felt that the, the, this, is, uh, this is maybe an extension onto that. I, uh, a call to action so, somewhat to say is what I orig originally had, you know, that, the, uh, the, the January sermon as a, almost like a foundation of what I wanted to, what God was dealing with me in my life. And in fact, last, last time I was here, you know, telling Keith, I was like, I wanted to shout it from from the rooftops, you know, y'all, y'all listen, y'all plant these seeds, and, and, and I wanted to get all excited, and I, I just didn't have the enthusiasm I felt like I should have had, but, um, you know, God, the word went out, and God did what he did with the word, and so that's, that's it, and, and I, I really believe that this is kind of a direct relationship to that, to that, and it's still, I guess it's so, it's still in my heart, and, and you see, we've changed over to lifestyle, we've moved on to a new, uh, uh, a new month and a new uh, new new uh, uh, theme and its lifestyle and and uh, I believe your lifestyle is determined by you. I believe that uh, you know you could easily change your lifestyle if you wanted to. I believe that you can stay in the lifestyle that you you've had. You could uh, not plant seeds of faith uh, throughout the year. You could uh, and that would be one lifestyle and another lifestyle would be planting those seeds of faith and and watching them grow and and harvesting them and and uh, so I mean you could uh, another lifestyle would be maybe sleeping in any chance you could you could sleep in or maybe you're an early riser that that becomes your lifestyle it's the tangible things and the untangible that really factor into what your lifestyle is so I, I, I see a lot of different, I mean, it, cultures even determine lifestyles, stuff like that. Technology determines lifestyles. Um, I don't know if you guys have watched uh, on TV the, the um, new Microsoft Hollow. Hey, uh, anybody see that? And these glasses you put on and, and you know, <laughs> eyeglasses eye, eye have nothing to do with, with this at all. I mean, the technology is so advanced and basically... What it is is you walk into a room and they, you watch this commercial. It's great. Got to go to YouTube and watch this. And, and this guy walks in and he's he looks at this gr gray wall and then he looks over here and and then he's you know there's nothing on the walls. He walks around this this you know I guess a kitchen divider where you would cook at and there's nothing on the cook. It's still dark gray you know black and white type thing. And walks by the kitchen sink, nothing there. And he walks by the refrigerator, nothing there. He reaches over and gets his Microsoft Hollows, puts them on. And all of a sudden, the TV is right there in front of him, right there on the wall. It wasn't there a minute ago, and then there's a cookbook sitting right there where the pages are just kind of like a little things bubbling up and down to, hey, change my page, you know, look for me, this is what I want you to do. On the refrigerator, a to-do list, a brand new to-do list is sitting up there, and it's all in bright colors, of course. You know, they want to give you that contrast. But I'll tell you what, 
a lifestyle is coming. A lifestyle change is coming. You can keep your 55-inch plasma flat TV sitting on your wall right now if you want to. Or you can get these Microsoft hollows. And you don't even have to have the TV up there anymore. All you got to do is program your glasses, pay the extra money. I'm sure it's probably the equivalent of your TV sitting on the wall. And you can have TV in any room you want. You can have everything you want right there and then. It's going to be a lifestyle changer. And I, I believe if it goes mainstream, which Microsoft, they pretty good with mainstream, Xbox. That's about all I can think of that's, that, besides a PC that's sitting on your, uh, on your desk. But I was going to mention their music thing, but people didn't even buy those. But it, enough of the geeky stuff, all right? When you can have a lifestyle change in your life, and it could be technology or something like that. When I became a Christian, I had a lifestyle change. I had a huge lifestyle change. I wasn't that angry young man that blamed everybody else for their problems and, and looked at life as if it was going to collapse on me. I changed. I had, a, I had a hope. I had a future. I had, I had something I wanted, to, I wanted to live for, and, and, and I directed my path in that direction. Our Holy Spirit slapped me around until I went down that path. And, and we can get that lifestyle. I changed my lifestyle to that Christian lifestyle. And where do you get your influences from? Where do you get your lifestyle influences from? Did you get them from mom? Did you get them from dad? Who, did, who influenced you the most to live that lifestyle? I'm kind of a cleanly person. Things go in a box, and, and things go, the box goes in the place, and the place has a door, and the door gets shut. And Amy's not exactly that li same lifestyle. So if you rewind all the way to the, their stuff, and then <laughs> that's kind of where we're at. Uh, she used to be, but she's not that way anymore. But you can, you can have things influence you in your lifestyle. And you have, to be, you have to be cognizant of that lifestyle, don't you? As a Christian, you have to be very cognizant of your lifestyle. I couldn't even imagine never, ever, ever going to the Benton Theater and watching a movie. I know Pastor has told me before. He does not go to the theater to, to watch a movie. If there's something that's up there that, 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 that he would want to see, he'll just wait for it. It's not going to be something you're going to see him doing is going to the theater. And I know Tony. Tony is a truck driver. Used to be a tr truck driver. Congratulations, Tony. Um, man, that's awesome. God called him to, to back into the ministry. And so I love to hear him preach, and, and uh, you know, he, he wanted to do that, so that's awesome that he got back into that. But he's a truck driver, and he, he's a, he, he should have the lifestyle of a truck driver, except he has to fight that lifestyle, doesn't he? He, has, he can't go around cussing and, you know, to, on his, in his lifestyle. So as a Christian, we have to have a particular lifestyle. We have to act a certain way in public that is not going to be contrary to what we are calling ourselves, if we're calling our, our, ourselves Christians, right? Right? Agreed? Anybody? No? Volunteer? Okay. Our congregation has to live a lifestyle. We, we as a church have to have, live a lifestyle. If we never got outside of Benton First Assembly, we couldn't be considered having that Christian lifestyle and living for it because we were supposed to give, we're supposed to go out, we're supposed to, you know, help the, help the, uh, the elderly, we're supposed to help the, the widow, we're supposed to be out there feeding, giving clothes. If we have to live that lifestyle of purity, of maybe even of uh, devotion to our services, uh, that, and that gets me because, you know, Trey's sitting at home. It, it, maybe mom brought him, I don't know, I, I, I had to go. But... <laughs> We have to have a devotion to our services, not just so pastor sees us in the audience, but so that the word can come out and that can feed us and it can quicken our hearts and, and change us in another way. It has to be our lifestyle. And to keep that lifestyle, we have to keep it pure. We have to keep it, have to be devoted to the service, to our community, like I said. But that's also so it keeps us closer to Christ and that we can have that relationship, and that we can keep building on it, and we can get closer and closer to Jesus, right? Get closer and closer to our Abba Father. But God help us if we try and fake our way into heaven. I've heard a hundred sermons about it. We fake our way in this, into heaven. We can't do it. There's no way you can fake the lifestyle of a Christian. It just can't be done. You're not going to get through it. In fact, I just got done seeing that new uh, uh, Left Behind movie. Anybody see it? Wow. Okay. 
it's actually pretty good. Y'all, y'all don't have to dog it. There is some CGI stuff, but if you get past the fact, watch it on a, a, a smaller TV or something, they, they, they do a pretty good job with it. But one of the points that, uh, okay, spoiler alert, uh, one of the points that, that, that happens is, is the little girl runs into the church. Oh, I just gave it away. The girl survives. Anyway, the, the girl runs into the church, and she sees this, this African-American pastor, and, and, he's, and he's sitting up there, and he's praying, and she's, she's confused. Why didn't you go? Why didn't you go? How come you didn't go? I believed the word, or I knew the word. I had it in my heart. I taught it. I did, the, I did the functions of the ministry, but I didn't really believe in my heart that it was true. I had doubts. I had questions. She runs out of there, of course, and not believing in him, you know, anymore. And so, of course, of course, would you? So that, 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 that act of faith that, that she had seen in him all, all this time was really just faith, right? Another thing is we have to keep our lifestyle to practice in, uh, to practice in a few things, Hopefully by living in the faith, walking in faith, and planning for the future by, like I said, planning something, planning faith today. Another one of those things that, like reading the Bible, you got to know your word. You got to know that you know that you know that that word that you just read is, is, is touching your heart, and you can understand it, you can comprehend it, and you can, you can, it doesn't just become cerebral, it actually cuts through into your heart, and you say, I need to make that a lifestyle change and add that to myself. Right? That's what, that's what knowing the word is. That's why when you read it, it comes alive and it bursts off the page to you. And it gives you, it gives you more of that, that, that the, the, the challenges that maybe even you don't get here in, in service where it's a congregational challenge, but you get that personal challenge right off the page. You have to know that word. And they talk about it. They, you, you get challenged. You're supposed to challenge the word that you're taught. Challenge the word so you go back and you read more Old Testament to confirm what the New Testament says and Lastly, I think we should, uh, we can't pursue our own ways. I think that we can pick up bits and pieces of our lifestyle and, 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 uh, and somehow we add it to our Christian life. We say, oh, you know, this, we, we're, supposed to, we're supposed to pick up our cross daily, right? But we go ahead and we go, well, I don't really feel like picking it up today. Maybe I can, like, throw it on a cart and drag it a little bit, you know? And we do that. We, we, we try and pursue our own ways in, in adding things to the Christian lifestyle instead of, instead of accepting the fact that we have to do it this way, this particular way. We go ahead and we try and make excuses or we try and add to it and we try and, you know, be more, be, be more uh, uh, compromising. Ooh, that's good. Ryan, when he was preaching on Sunday, did a great job, excellent job on Sunday morning. I was, I, I wanted to just be, the, I guess I was the only one amening him, I, guess, I don't know, but I was taking tons and tons of notes. And I love the way Ryan says it, this, and I'm, I'm sure it's been said before in different ways, but it really touched me when he said it. He was like, it's not that God's miracles are being held back, and it's not that that, that God has limits that he's saying, oh, I can't release this. I can't give my Shekinah glory to this church. I can't have revival in this church. I can't go to Benton first and, and heal all these people. What he said was that we are the people of the church and we're the ones that are holding it back. He said it's one thing and one thing only, and it's the lack of the faith of the people of Christ that are closest to him. Did you get that? The people that are closest to Christ are us, the Christians. We're supposed to be living that lifestyle, and we're, we're supposed to be devoting our lives to this, and we're supposed to say, yeah, I want to jump on board, I want to jump on board. And it's us. We don't believe it can be done. We don't believe that we can, we can have a packed church on a Wednesday night, or we don't believe that, that, there can be, that you could walk up to the next person and go, hey, come to church with me. Or that there will be no sitting room anywhere that that pastor had that vision of, of or anything. It, it's us. It's the ones that are closest to Christ that keeps the the miracles from happening. And so, uh, so when we step, we actually step out of faith. We step out of faith. So if you don't mind, I want to take a few minutes to convey a story that I, I was reading in the Old Testament. I, I believe it's going to support my my. Uh, uh, 
my, my, my sermon here of lifestyle that, that you should be true, you, should be, you can't fake it, that you should have an intimacy with the word, and that you can't be on your own way. You can't combine it with the, God's way with your way. You have to simply do it his way. So like I said, we're going to be bouncing back and forth around Judges 11 and 12. And I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament, back uh, before Egypt was in captivity, uh, the, before the leadership of Moses, before the leadership of Aaron, uh, before Joshua, and God's people, believe it or not, would suffer lifestyle changes. They would have, they would have something happen in their lifestyle where they would get complacent with their lifestyle and they wouldn't be praying as much or they wouldn't be, be giving God the glory as much or whatever. And they became, they became I guess, the uh, well, best way to say is they didn't please God anymore. And so God s sent judges to these people so that they could, to Israelites, so that they could actually... Uh, be brought back out of this 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 pit of 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 undesirable actions that God that God has seen them in, and to change their lifestyle to give them more directions. In fact, judges come came before kings, uh, King David, and before Saul. These judges were sent to Israel, and uh, and this is why it says in Judges seventeen six, in those days there was no king in Israel; everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Come on now, you had a car accident before. If you got out every time and you did what was right in your own eyes, you had to have some restraint, didn't you, Keith? A little bit of restraint from the, from the people that, the, that you had your accident with? Maybe, no, I would. I would have to, that, I'd, have to, I'd have to push down that anger of somebody slamming me in the back or coming out, coming out of nowhere or, or even the frustration of myself you know, hitting somebody else. Anyway. And I know you're familiar with some of these names that are going to be here, you know, Judges, Deborah, Samson, Eli, Abimelech, but no, I don't even want to talk about any of those. And in fact, he's mentioned in Hebrews 11 as one of the heroes of faith. He, you know, not Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Jacob, Je Moses, Rehab. It says in 1131, and what shall I say? I should say even more for time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, or Samuel. This is one of the judges, and I want to tell you, talk about Jephthah real quick. There's a lot in this, and there's a lot of uh, other stories that, that, that continue on with Jephthah, and there's some neat stuff in there. I really, really challenge you to read about his daughter and, uh, and uh, see what the commentaries say about that. That's a, that's a fun little study right there. But Jephthah's, uh, Jephthah's uh, life was real, real kind of like uh, uh, hairy in the beginning. Jephthah was uh, born of a, of a family of bunch of a bunch of boys that um, all were born of, a, of his wife and him, but Jephthah himself was born of a prostitute. So the older boys, jealous, said, you ain't going to get any of our money, and kicked him out of the house, kicked him to the curb. So Job went, uh, Jephthah went to live in the land of Tob, and while he's out there living, he kind of like gets... Uh, I imagine him wearing like maybe a black leather jacket with his little cigarettes rolled up in the corner of his, you know, his shirt and, and wearing his leathers and riding his motorcycle. He's with a bad crowd, basically. The uh, Bi Bible says that it's worthless men branded together with Jephthah and they go out raiding with him. So he's really not, yeah, I know I said he was in the hero of faith, but he's not doing it right here. But soon... The Gilead leaders come over to him, come to Jephthah, because he is a mighty man of, of, of valor, I guess. He's a mighty man of, 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 of fighting, and he's a grand uh, person to fight with. And that's why I kind of picture him on that motorcycle going, starting, you know, gang fights or going into the, you know, the bars, you know, in Israel and, you know, beating up all the people for no reason anyway. So he... Uh, He's, he's, he's approached by these men of Gilead, the leaders of Gilead, and they said, hey, come fight for us. Come fight for us. And he's like, you kicked me out. You totally kicked me to the curb. I was the, I was the bad seed. I was the one you didn't want anymore. And so, of course, they, he's, you know, questions about that, and they're like, no, 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 no. We promise we're going to put you in charge. 
And they do. They put him in charge of his armies, which basically or essentially means that he's kind of in charge of Israel, right? In the direction of Israel. And the reason why they came to him and asked him to be that is because they're going to go, they have to go fight the, the uh, uh, Ammonites, right? Ammonites. Ammonites. I'm saying that right. Anyway, so he, they, he has to go defend Israel against them. The, 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 the people of Ammon are coming and they, they want to destroy the people of Israel. And of course, this is, this is, you know, constant battle back and forth and stuff. Jephthah tries a couple things first, sends a couple letters, says, hey, you know, I don't know why you're attacking us. You know, here's what happened. It's a long story. And tells him everything that happened on, on Israel's path through, uh, to, to, through that area. And the first response he, he gets is kind of like a snide response. And then they, the, the king just stops recognizing his letters anymore. So he has to go to war. What does he do? Yay, he gives, the, he gives God the glory. He says, God, bring me out of this and we'll, we'll do some other stuff, right? I'm not gonna go into that other part of that story, but he basically goes to God and says, hey, can you do this? So God was part of his lifestyle. God was part of, of the, way he, the way he did things and he brought these things to God and Israel was given a great victory over the Ammonites and it was a, a great ending to a glorious story but not all was peaceful in the land of Israel. Why not? Well, Ephraim was upset. Ephraim, another tribe of Israel, gets upset, and they're furious that Jephthah went to war without him. Oh, my. Jephthah, you poor thing. And they, so, uh, so, the, so the Ephraims come over there, and they decide that they're going to go to Jephthah's house, they cross over the Jordan River, they go over to where he's at, and they say, hey, we're here today because you didn't invite us over to, to, to fight with you, and we're really upset, and we're really mad, and he's, he's like, I, I gave a call to everybody of Israel. I'm sorry you didn't get the message, so of course he first tries to defuse the situation, and so they were, we're going to burn down the house with your, uh, right over your head. We're just going to burn it right down, you're going you're gonna to be gone. He had nothing to do with, with that. Like I said, he was a fighter. And he went back, he went to fight with the, them. Basically, uh, it's in Je uh, Judges 12.1, where we pick that part up. It says, uh, Ephraimite forces were called out and crossed over to the Zaphron, where they said to Jephthah, why did you go to fight with the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn down your house over your head. They were, like I said, they were threatened because they went, Jephthah went by himself. He tried to explain himself, didn't work. God had already given him the victory over the Ammonites, but wasn't good enough. And so now, Jephthah's forces are fighting basically his cousins, right? Nephews, I guess. You know, these would be, this is family. He's fighting family. And Judges uh, 12, 5 and 6 said the uh, uh, Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan opposite Ephraim. And it happened when any of the fugitives of Ephraim came, said, let me cross over the men of Gilead would say to them, are you an Ephraimite? Of course we're not. We just want to get over to the other side. We weren't just fighting you with blood dripping down their faces. And he said, no, no, we're not. And then they would say to them, say now Shibboleth. And they would say Sibboleth, for they could not pronounce it correctly. They would seize those people. They would kill those people that tried to flee over the Jordan River. And it says that on that day they killed 40 and 2,000 Ephraims, Ephraimites. Some commentaries say that that is 2,040. Other commentaries say that's 42,000. Not even part, worried about that. We're not going to concentrate on that right now. But the men of Gilead held at the crossing that Jordan River. And they would ask them, well, how, what do you say? Are you, part of, are you part of the clan that just fought us? Of course, they'd say no to hide, to keep their hide. But the test... The Gilead men knew that the Ephraim men could not say the word stream or shibboleth properly. Just like I say creek, that's not apparently how you say it down here. It's crick, or I can't even say it wrong. I drive on the feeder roads. You guys drive on the, what is it, uh, the road that goes next to the highway, the, the access road. Uh, I'm from the north. I mean, some of the stuff I say, some of the ways I say it, it's going to be reflected in that. It's going to be in my accent. 
going to be in my lifestyle, how I've said stuff, how I learned it from mom and dad. Basically, the men of Ephraim didn't have the word right. And try as they might, the Bible says they could not say it right because of their accent or their lifestyle or their slang. And I'm going to try and get through these really quick for you. You see, you cannot fake Christianity lifestyle. You cannot say, you cannot spend your life living in a chicken coop and then say, I'm a chicken. It doesn't work that way. You could live your whole life that way, but that you are not, does not make you a chicken. And you may be able to fool others. You may be able to say, raise your hand at the right time and sing the hallelujahs at the right time, know all the verses of the songs, and do all the stuff that you're supposed to do, walk right and talk right. But if you don't know it in your heart, you're going to be just like that preacher that was met at the, at, the, uh, 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 at the altar with that little girl. Why are you still here? Well, I knew all that stuff. I knew how to say it, right? Knew how to raise my hand. Knew all the songs and stuff. But it wasn't in my lifestyle. It wasn't, in, it wasn't part of my lifestyle at, at all. And faith needs to be planted so that God can continue to grow it. So that in your lifestyle, you know that you know that you know that this faith is real. And of course, he'll test you with things and he'll give you miracles and stuff like that. And your faith, it comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that word is shibboleth. Acting like a Christian does not mean you know the word in your heart. God understands every heart in, inten in the intents of, uh, in, sorry, intents of our thoughts. A Christian can be defined as a person who has faith, received and fully uh, trusted in Jesus Christ as our only Savior for sin. And in the heart of the Christian resides the Spirit of Christ, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. And this person is therefore not a Christian. Either you are a Christian or you are not a Christian. This is black and white. There is no gray here. I understand sanctification. I understand that once you become a Christian that you're going to grow in your Christendom. I understand that, but what I'm saying is either you are a Christian and you believe in Christ that he, that he did what he what, what the Bible says he did, or you are not a Christian. You are for God, or you are against God. And try as you might, you can try and fake it, but in the end, shibboleth will come out as sibboleth, and you'll be known by your fruit. Malachi 3.18 says, Thou shalt return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth not. I believe also that you have to intimately know the word. And the word gives you life. The life is actually in the word. And failure to know, emotionally know that word, means death. You have to know the word of God for yourself. You have to depend on it. You, have, you cannot depend on somebody else's faith to, to heal somebody for you. You have to depend it on yourself. You cannot depend on, some, on somebody else to, to read this book to you and have it jump off the pages. You have to read it yourself. You, you, have, you have to have a confidence that when you speak in God, for, for God, when you speak in his name, that you actually can speak to the almighty creator yourself, the, the alpha and the omega. You can speak to him because you know who you are in the word and what you've become in the word so that when, you're, when you reach your father in heaven, he treats you as the son that you are. You have to know that already. When someone comes up to you and says, are you a Christian? What they're asking you is not only your testimony that's already in your heart, you ha and you start to talk and you start to give them the information that you have that, you know, God has done this and God has done that. You ha you're showing them your testimony. You're showing them your Christianity, and you're giving them the word that God's put in your heart to give to them. You're giving them that shibboleth. Because it's a saving word in this story, it's shibboleth. But the saving word in your life today is Jesus Christ. And don't just say, say the word out. Don't just mumble the word. Call out on his name. Know that you can call out on your name and believe in it. And because you've planted those, those faith seeds earlier on, you can call on those right now. And the, everything that's in your soul, you, and you cannot deny what's, what's happening because... 
you've had the truth poured out in you, not cerebrally, but in your heart. Peter did that. He let his accent uh, change how, uh, how he viewed, how he was viewed. It says in uh, Matthew 26, 73 and 74, a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you too are one of them, for even you, the way you talk gives you away. Another version says, your accent gives you away. Then he began to curse and swear. Did he really? He was walking with Christ not too long ago. Did he really? I don't know that man, and immediately a roast, rooster crowed. Failure to know the word, failure to know Jesus is death. And in the, in the, it says in John 4, 1, 1 through 4, in the beginning was the word. Word was with God. Word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through all him things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of the mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You have to not just know the words as word, words in your Bible. You have to have a personal relationship with that word, a personal relationship with Christ. My last point, simply put, you have to be exactly, you have to do exactly, I'm sorry, excuse me, you have to put it exactly the way the word says it. Nothing can be added to it and nothing to take, can be taken away. Say the Am Amalites have given God, uh, were given to God by Jephthah, given them as, as, a, as a struggle and, and God took it and, and handed it over to Jephthah. Maybe God's given you a, a victory in your life. And you know it's God, and you can confirm it's God, and you know in your heart it's God. And there's nothing that you can deny that this victory happened, except your family comes up, and your family comes against you and says, this won't be a victory, or I'm going to talk some, some darkness into your life, or I'm going to say, that can't happen. It never can happen. It, it's never happened that way before, so therefore it can't happen. And because you love your family, you're stretched, and you're you're, you worry about you know, what they said. Your family comes against you like Ephraim did to Jephthah. And they want to go to war with you about, what, about whatever. Or maybe they, they have some, maybe a petty communication error that, that you're saying it one way and they're saying it another. And you know that you know that you know that you're saying it the way God wants you to, to have it, to say it. And they, they're, they, they're out to destroy you. They're out, they're your family, your own family is out to destroy you because you give God the glory and not their, the family for their structure or how they raised you or they try to destroy your Z and tell you it's not real. It was fake. Oh, you must have been on drugs. It was a dream. It's not reality. It wasn't God. So what do you do? You fold, right? No, not at all. Just like Jephthah, he went back out to war. You gather your strength and you fight again. But this time the word itself is, your, is, is, is against your enemy. You say, oh, brother from the north or sister from the south or cousin from the west... Say the word shibboleth, and when they say sibboleth, you know that they're not standing in the same place that you are. You can stand in the word, and you don't, get to, you don't have to soften your stance. God knew you, that, that he would divide you against your family. It says that uh, in Luke 5, 1, 51, excuse me, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. From now on, five members in one household will be divided, three against two, two against three, and they will be divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Your family is not always going to support you. They may not agree with you. In fact, my family has said, well, let's just agree to disagree. And I want to shout out, no! No! I know it's true, and my heart tells me it's true. I already know the truth. You, you can't convince me different. And if you water it down for the sake of ease and you would just accept whatever they say, then you're not giving God the glory. You're not giving the victory of your, the, uh, that you just had in your life to God. You basically made the word sibboleth instead of shibboleth. You've changed it. You've removed his glory out of it. You've taken away the power out of that word. You've changed the word. Never change the word. The word is shibboleth. And if you choose to, and may God have mercy on you, soul, you can give him less than the word. But I challenge you that you will probably be held accountable for that.
God's commanded us not to change the word because he is the author, the eternal copyright. He allows us, in fact, no, he commands us to copy it and spread it throughout the, all the world, doesn't he? However, he strictly forbids adding or removal from his word, even a letter, even H. Don't change shibboleth to sibboleth. It says uh, Deuteronomy that you shall not add a word to the word which I command you, neither you'll diminish it aught from it, that you may keep my commandment to the Lord for which I commanded you. Prohibition on altering God's word is not just in the Old Testament. It says in Revelation, I testify unto every man that here's my words in the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God will add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part in the book of life out of the holy city from the things that are written in this book. That's in Revelations 22, 18 and 19. Don't change the word. God has a very high opinion of his word. His word lasts forever. It doesn't end. It always will be and always was. He forbids us from polluting it or adding, in front, adding to it and taking from it. And in fact, a spiritually fragmented word becomes pockmarks on the face of God. Don't walk in your own way and pursue your own righteousness. Don't infuse what your lifestyle that you have now into a, the lifestyle of Christendom. You are either a Christian or you are not a Christian. Don't try and combine all those things together. Don't make it just easy on yourself by doing that. Don't infuse this book, this chapter, or any verse in this book with anything other than the God-inspired word that, he, that he's given to you. The word is shibboleth, not sibboleth. For the word of the Lord is right and true, and he is faithful in all he does. So I'm going to ask you to con con contemplate, to think about it, to th and think about what your sibboleth is. Is it waiting to be accepted so much, willing to be, wanting to be accepted so much that you're willing to walk through life, fake it as a Christian? Do you know the word well enough that you can be intimate with the word? Or instead of intimate, are you imitator of the word? Are you going to ride the fence, so to say, accept the word but live in the world? Convince yourself it really doesn't matter. That gives me a chance for grace to even work even more so in my life. Heavens no. Will you walk with pride, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of eyes and the, that are this world, not of, the, not of our Father in heaven? And I, I tell you, I'm convinced that this time is short. I'm convinced that our time is passing away. I'm convinced that the world's revelations, I'm sorry, revolutions are not going to continue much longer. I just have it in my heart right now that we just, the clock has already started. The clock has already started. We've seen signs in the skies, the Hebrew calendar being fulfilled. We see, we see things in Revelations just, just popping off the page being fulfilled with the present restoration of Israel and the city of Jerusalem we're now very close to the end of the church age and the world just is groaning for the start of the seventh week, 70th week so I ask you what does your lifestyle say about you does it say I walk in truth of the word does it say I have a personal relationship with that word does it say I live with no compromise without compromising any of the word? Or does the word instead of shibboleth, does it say sibboleth? If you stand with me, we'll pray. God, you're holy and you're worthy and we thank you for your son and what he's done for us. Lord, <clears throat> we thank you for the son and what he's done for us in his flesh. Died for us and brought us salvation to your people. Forgive us, Lord, for what we've done, how we've missed the mark, Lord how we've missed that mark. We're an unholy and unworthy generation, and we're unworthy of your grace. Direct us daily, Lord Jesus, with your Holy Spirit. Lead us through this, 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 the craziness of life. Make the path clear for us. Show us that righteousness. Let your shibboleth of your waters, your living waters, fill us to overflowing. Lord, just put your loving arms around us as if it were a, a hedge of protection. 
Keep us, Lord. Guide us and direct us. Until we're in your presence again, in Jesus' holy name, amen. You guys are dismissed.